the show that reveals how extraordinary items in our world are designed, constructed and produced. See the engineering, the technology and big ideas that make the world go round. Find out how it works. Coming up, making the perfect brew. How tea leaves picked from a field are processed, blended and end up in a tea bag. Recycling cars. Retrieving the hidden treasures out of your exhausted motor. And camembert. How mold spores are added to soured milk to make a cheese with a very distinctive aroma. But first, logging with a big difference. One of Canada's most important natural resources is its vast forests. Over the years, the millions of acres filled with trees have been something of a battleground between the timber industry and environmentalists. But one company may have found a small part of the solution. Instead of chopping down living trees, they chop down dead ones with the sawfish harvester. Around the world, there are about 260 million trees that stand on the bottom of reservoirs and dams. When they were flooded, the trees died, but their wood has been preserved by the water that killed them. It would be a very risky business to try using a chainsaw while you're wearing a scuba tank. So a Canadian company developed the ultimate tool for the job. It's a remote-controlled vehicle which plunges to the bottom of lakes and cuts down the dead trees with a chainsaw. The chainsaw is over four feet long and can cut through the dead wood in seconds. Each of these 37 airbags will be screwed into a trunk and will lift it up to the surface. There are two propellers which can spin in either direction. These steer the sawfish in and out of the underwater trees. The three-ton machine is carefully lowered into the murky depths. As its air chambers fill with water, the sawfish sinks. The sawfish has got eight cameras and sonar on board, so the team on the platform can see what it sees at the bottom of the lake. It's remotely operated from the safety of a control room. A driver uses a couple of joysticks to steer it towards a dead trunk, which is about to get the chop. When the sawfish is in position, it deploys a pair of pincers to grasp the trunk and hold itself in place. Then it drills one of the floats into the tree's trunk before inflating it. Then it's time to get physical. As soon as the sawfish cuts through the trunk, the airbag heaves the mighty tree to the water's surface. Without these flotation devices, the logs would sink to the bottom and be lost.
the sawfish doesn't hang about. It's got 37 airbags and it intends to use them all. It's a very efficient machine. It can attach itself to a tree, secure a float, and saw through the trunk all in just 30 seconds. Its mission accomplished, and the sawfish is hoisted out of the water by a crane. With the floats attached to the trunks, it doesn't take long to track them down and haul them back. The trunks have been secured to the platform, and now the floats can be detached. These will be used over and over again to keep bringing the valuable timber up to the surface. Because these trees grow slowly over many years, the wood is very dense. This fact, coupled with their eco-credentials, will help the timber to fetch up to three times the price of ordinary trees. With around 260 million more submerged trees around the world, the sawfish will be getting its teeth stuck in for many years to come. Sometimes you just can't beat a nice hot cup of tea. Nowadays, most of us make a brew with tea bags bought in a local supermarket, but tea starts life many thousands of miles away. India is one of the world's largest tea producers. The industry here employs nearly one and a half million people, and in tea plantations like this one, workers pick the valuable leaves from March to October. The best parts of the plant for making a cuppa are the tip and the top leaves. These need to be processed while they're still fresh to ensure the best possible quality, so it's all done on site. First, the tea leaves are rolled. This breaks them down and releases the juices that give tea its flavor. The next step is fermentation. The broken leaves are laid out onto tables in a humid environment. This allows them to absorb oxygen and they turn a copper brown color. The tea is then sorted through a series of sieves. The different sizes affect how long the tea will need to be brewed for. Now the tea has been preserved, it can be boxed up and sent to factories around the world, including here in Hamburg. Tea from Indonesia, China and India arrive here, ready to be blended into popular varieties by tea experts. In the testing room, a taster prepares hundreds of cups of tea every day, made with samples from each shipment. She carefully measures out exactly the same quantity of each variety, so she'll be able to compare them accurately. She also needs to use the same quantity of water and brew them for the same amount of time. As tea lovers know, all of these factors affect the flavor and strength of a good cuppa. After about six minutes, she strains off the tea leaves and puts them to one side for further examination. This woman definitely knows her Darjeeling from her Assam. To become a taster, you have to train for a minimum of five years. First, she inspects the leaves. She's judging them by their fragrance, size, color, and crispness. These tell her how good the quality of the leaves are, how well they've been dried, and ultimately, if they'll make a great cup of tea. 
Then it's time for her to get slurping. By quickly slurping the tea into her mouth, she also takes in a healthy gulp of oxygen. This aerates the tea into a fine mist which travels over all of her taste buds. When she has made her assessment, the factory then creates its house blend from varying quantities of the different teas. This is packed up into tea bags and finally labelled. So the next time you're enjoying a fine brew, think of all the tasters out there spitting out tea so you don't have to. Coming up after the break, smashing up old bangers. Why, even when your car is beyond repair, it doesn't need to be the end of the road. And find out how a factory turns 100,000 litres of milk into camembert cheese. It's easy to become attached to your old car. After all, it's been your companion for many years. But when the garage bills start to pile up, it's time to say goodbye. So why not let your old friend go to a good cause? Breakers yards like this one pay hard cash to strip away parts and recycle the scrap metal. Every used car contains oils and industrial fluids. So holes are drilled to safely dispose of the environmentally harmful liquids. Once that's done, the breakers get on with stripping anything that can be sold on to another motorist. When someone buys this door, it will transform their three-door wreck into the four-door family car it once was. These yards are an Aladdin's cave for car owners who want to save a few quid. Instead of buying expensive new parts, they can pick up old ones for a fraction of the cost and do their bit for the environment because this recycling saves valuable energy and resources. Once they've salvaged all the parts they can, it's time for the car to meet its maker. Motor enthusiasts, look away now. heavy-duty crane places it into the jaws of the crusher. All little boys enjoy smashing up toy cars, but this guy gets to pulverize real ones up to 50 times a day. With a force of 600 tons, the sliding walls reduce the vehicle to scrap metal. The train that heaved up a hatchback minutes ago now lifts a heap of crushed metal onto a train for its last journey to the recycling yard. These cars will never speed down a country lane ever again. But there is an upside. They'll never see a traffic warden again either. No matter if it was an Aston Martin or an Austin Allegro, they all get the same treatment. A cutter chops them into bite-sized pieces so they'll fit into the shredder.
the X cars are lifted up onto a conveyor belt, where they patiently wait to have the life squeezed out of them. However well built they were in their heyday, none of them are any match for the Shredder with its 2,000 horsepower engine. When you see what comes out of the other side of the shredder, you can really see why it's called scrap metal. Steel is separated from the other materials by this magnetic drum. After the aluminium has also been sifted out, what's left is junk, and this will be buried in a landfill site. All the metals that have been saved fall onto a vast pile. This is the treasure of the recycling plant. Enormous tractors load the scrap metal onto trains, and it's then taken off to a processing plant. There, it'll be turned into washing machines, toasters, bridges or maybe just back into a car. Every year, around 2 million cars are recycled in the UK, and about 80% of the mass of each car is used in another form. So don't be too downhearted when your loyal friend is beyond repair. It's not the end of its life, it's just a new beginning. Cows are milked all over Europe. But this milk won't be poured over cornflakes. It's got a higher calling. And in just over a week, it's going to be camembert cheese. Every day, over 100,000 litres of fresh milk are delivered to this factory. The milk is transported into tanks where it's heated to kill any bacteria. Lactic acid is added to sour the milk. Then mold spores are added. Although they're only a thousandth of a millimeter in size, they'll still have a big effect on the final product. The soured milk is poured into large tubs that hold up to 2,000 litres. And an enzyme is added which will thicken the mixture. The mixture is set and can be separated into curds and whey. First, a grid of small squares cuts lengthways. Then another grid cuts sideways. The cube sinks to the bottom and the liquid whey deposits on top. It's all sieved through a machine, and most of the whey is drained off. The cubes are then firmly pressed into round pots, and for the first time it starts to look like cheese. 
each pot is flipped several times. This removes any remaining whey and compresses the cubes further. Stacked on trays, the pots are turned several more times before they join 200,000 other pots for a 10-hour rest. The next step is a salt bath. This helps to preserve the cheeses. After a wash and a rest, the cheeses are now solid enough to be removed from their moulds. It's also time for the mould spores that were added earlier to kick into action as they're sent off to mature. As they're exposed to oxygen, the spores grow on the surface. The camembert is regularly turned to avoid the mould growing on the grid. The effect of the mould is to reduce the acid growing on the cheese's skin and to ripen the inside, giving it a creamy texture. This process gives the cheese its distinctive flavour and smell. After seven days, the cheese is ready to be packed. You might be used to seeing camembert in wedges or full round blocks, but here it's cut in halves and they're wrapped individually. The halves are reunited in a cardboard box. And then they're ready to be eaten off crackers, toasted in sandwiches, or even melted down at a fondue party.